uh, our brothers and sisters from Mississauga. Um, it's great uh, that everybody's here. We pray that God continue uh, to bring us all in unity uh, and, and bring us all um, to know Him more and to glorify His name. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce the speaker for tonight, um, who's a, a dear friend of mine. And something that we have in common is that we both love Texas very much. Um, so that's, uh, that's kudos uh, for, for that. Um, he's uh, a servant at St. Mary and St. Athanasius. Um, and uh, he'll be speaking to us today and contemplating in a discussion about a life of prayer. Uh, we thank him very much for uh, taking time um, out of his schedule to come and, uh, and bless us. We pray that God gives us a word uh, on, his, uh, on his mouth. And uh, thank you all once again. And uh, let's give a big hand for him. That was an awesome intro. Let's end on that note and not ruin it with my talk. Okay. So first I want to introduce my topic. Um, it's kind of a weird topic. Life of prayer, also known as a prayer life. But I have a reservation with the topic name. Uh, when we talk about different kinds of life, we talk about a prayer life. We all have social lives, correct? We have a social life. We have a professional life, a school life, and all these kind of lives. Now when we say social life uh, and school life and professional life, what we really mean is different aspects of one life, correct? So when we say social life, I'm not talking a life that is completely social. I'm talking about the social aspect of my life. It doesn't take my whole life over, it's just a compartment. But that's not what I mean when I say a life of prayer. When I say a life of prayer, I mean a life of, that prayer penetrates your entire life. So your social life is intermingled with prayer. And your professional life is intermingled with prayer. So it's more of an all-encompassing uh, theme rather than a compartment of your life. And that's going to be one of the biggest things I want to talk about today is compartmentalizing prayer. Little hint, don't do it. Um, one of the questions that we got to ask ourselves is, why should I pray? And this is one of the questions that a lot of us have struggled with. And we've always asked the question, well, does it make a difference to pray? Well, the answer is a resounding yes. Um, what does prayer do? One of the biggest things we have to know is that God doesn't need my prayer. And God is perfect. To say that God needs something means He is lacking something. And to say God is lacking something is logically incoherent. Because if God is perfect, He cannot lack. So God does not need my prayer. I don't give Him anything. God doesn't need my friendship, right? God is in perfect unity within Himself. The Holy Trinity is in perfect unity with itself. So He doesn't need all of us to be His best friends. He's fine as He is. So prayer isn't for God. The only other option is that it is for me. So what does prayer do? One of the biggest things it does is... Uh, oh, sorry, I should use one of my quotes here. Can I get someone to read this by any chance? Anyone want to read? Sure. Go ahead, please. God does not need our prayers. He knows what we need and even ask, and even before we ask. He is the all-merciful and He pours His abundant bounties even on those who do not ask Him. It is for us that prayer is indispensable. It, appro it appropriates man to God. Exactly. So what He's basically saying is, no, God doesn't need your <coughs> prayer. If I stop praying, I don't withhold anything from God. God doesn't suffer because I don't pray. So prayer is for me. Um... I really like how he says he is all merciful and he pours his abundant bounties even on those who do not ask him. Right? I'm going to get to this idea. What he's, what he's, he's not saying you don't have to ask him. He's just saying that prayer is not all about asking God for this, give me this, give me that. And that's not, what it's, that's not what it's made for. That's not why Christ gave it to us as a gift. So what does prayer do? Prayer reminds us that we are not of this world. The biggest question we have now is how can I be saved in a world that's geared towards sexual sins, in a world that's geared towards atheism? How can I be saved? Well, the simple answer is to realize that even though we are not monks, we are outside this world while in it. And prayer is a constant reminder that we are not of this world. Prayer is the only way to live out a life of salvation. I don't think anybody really can disagree with that. I just don't think we've realized what that means. There is no way to live out a life of salvation except through prayer. Salvation is only accomplished through Christ and through His grace. And we know that that grace comes through a communion with us and Christ through the gift of prayer. And if we deny prayer, we're really shooting ourselves, you know, we're shooting our toes off. We, we can't get 
to the salvation that we really desire. Finally, prayer is a support. It's the rod with which we're able to tour the way of salvation. We are blind men, in a sense. All of us are blind men, or women, and we're blind. We're on the way to salvation, and we really don't know much. We have our fathers, we have the scripture, but we need a, a relationship with Christ to be able to continue that. And this is exactly what St. John Climacus says. Can I get someone to read that? Anyone? Someone start reading? Hold on to the staff of prayer, and you will not fail. And even a fall will not be fatal, since prayer is a devout, persistent coercing of God. So the idea is, prayer is our rod which we lean on. Of course, there's other things that we need to lean on in the spiritual path. We need to lean on our readings, on our friends, on our fathers, and all this stuff. Prayer is one of the biggest ones. If you pray, you will not fall as much. I mean, it, it will help you. It will allow you, by realizing you are not part of this world, true prayer will help that. And if you fall, it won't be devastating. Because again, the devastation comes from not understanding our relationship with God. And prayer fixes that. So it won't be um, a devastating fall. Basically, if you do not pray, expect nothing. Do not expect to be renewed. There's no way to renew you. You've cut yourself off from the source of renewal. Do not ask for grace. You've cut yourself off from the source of grace. Don't ask to be changed. Only Christ can change. We can't change ourselves. We change through Christ and through our relationship with Him. If you don't have that, you will not change. If you decide not to pray, then what you're doing is you're submitting to your own will. Which sometimes gets me. People sometimes say, you know, I, I think this is the will of God. And I say, well, did you really pray about it? Because yeah, I got prayed for like, like 10 minutes and, and that was it. I'm like, are you sure it's the will of God? Or is this your will which you're projecting onto God without really taking you know, the steps necessary to make that decision? So if you don't pray, you're not going to get changed. There's no change. Grace is cut short. And you're left to the whims and fancies of your own mind. Needless to say, they don't go very far. Um, I'd like to do a drastic redefining of prayer. So we've all known the simple uh, definition of prayer which we've been given from our earliest youth is prayer is talking to God. And it's a good, it's a good one. It's, it's awesome and it works. But I don't want it to be our only limitation on prayer. Because prayer is much more than, um, than just words and then just saying a couple things to an empty wall which we sometimes try to use our imagination and say that God is there. And we try to imagine Him there. Prayer is more than, than this. It's not lying to the self and saying, right there is God and I can see Him but I just can't see Him because of my eyes. It's much more than that. It's a life. The biggest thing I want to I wanna stress is that prayer is a state of being, not a position of being. So what does that mean? It means that as long as I am... Uh, I acknowledge and I practice the presence of God with me, this is prayer. Now this has a benefit and a downfall. The benefit is awesome. It means that I can pray while not praying. Which means I don't need to be in a position of prayer to be in prayer. What positions do we have? Well, we have things like kneeling, we have things like crossing ourselves, we have metanias, we have things like holding the igbeya, and certain movements that are good, and these are awesome. And I'm not saying cut them out. I'm going to talk about this later. I'm not saying cut them out. I'm saying don't restrict them, don't restrict it to that. I can be praying while not crossing myself, while not leaning, doing matanis and holding the igbeya. As long as I am in a state of prayer, which is being aware of the presence of God. So the benefit, I can pray while not praying. I don't need to be holding my igbeya. The precaution is the exact opposite, which means I can be not praying while praying, right? So I can stand up in my room, do the whole close the door thing, close the eye thing, hold the igbeya, drop to the floor a couple times, sign of the cross, drop to the floor, sign of the cross, do that as many times as I want, and I will have accomplished zero. Because what did I do? All I did was, I did a duty, I checked something off my list, so that when I go to Abuna the next day, he says, did you pray, comply in prayer? I say, yes, you're right. <laughs> but did I do anything? No. I've turned it into an idolatry. I've made it about myself, feeling good about myself, being able to have that checklist, right? This is exact opposite of what it does. We've always been told since our youth, and again, something that we haven't really uh, contemplated much, is that they say a prayer in which you're not concentrated is not a prayer. I've always been told this. And what that translated to was, yeah, it's a prayer, just not a good one. No, well, the reality is, it's not a prayer. I don't know how to say this nicely, but I think it's the exact opposite of a prayer. If God is giving you this gift, this gift of coming into His presence, and you make it nothing more than self-gratification, then, I mean, it's not really... 
not a blessing whatsoever. It's not a prayer. Something else we have to know is that this is prayer is not one sided. It's nothing more than internal divine call of love and man's response. Okay, so it is unnatural for us to want to pray. It's it's not necessarily natural. We are very egotistical people. How how is this going to benefit me? I can spend ten minutes holding a book and reading it, or I can hang out with my friends. Which one's better? The ego is going to obviously tell you hang out with your friends. Further, man's response is not his own. Our response to this prayer is not my response. It's facilitated by the Holy Spirit. Which is really weird. It seems that we do nothing. Both the call and the response is facilitated by the Holy Spirit. But this is exactly what Christ means in John 15, 5. Is without me, you can do nothing. It's in prayer that this, this saying is fulfilled. Oftentimes, we just translate it to, if I want to you know, be a doctor, have Jesus with you, because without me, you can do nothing. That's it. But there's a little more to it. Prayer itself. Without Christ, you cannot pray. Another thing is that prayer is living out the life of Christ. And I may get more into each of these specifics later. But the life of Christ, although is above time, I want to summarize it as best I can in three events. Or three periods. We got the incarnation of God. You know, into Jesus Christ. We have the suffering of Christ. We have, along with the crucifixion. And we finally have the resurrection. The idea is that our prayer must be exactly that. It must start with a humbling of ourselves. First thing Christ did is He humbled Himself from the throne, from the throne came to us. We must humble ourselves from our self-erected throne. We've all erected our thrones and we've all sat on those thrones. Break them down. First step of prayer, humble yourself. Second step, you are going to suffer. Prayer is a process that involves a lot of suffering. So we have to suffer. All the while, while we suffer, we know that we are sharing in the sufferings of Christ Himself. So that should be a blessing. Finally, Christ comes up victorious. And with that victorious body, the resurrection, with His resurrection, He trampled death. And with His life, He gave life to all else. So like us, if we persist in prayer, we become changed into the image of Christ. We become more like Him. And because of this, we are able to transform others without even speaking. We don't need to have our words spoken. Our simple change becomes a change to all else and a blessing to all. Another point that I want to talk, this is my last point in this uh, subject, is that truest and greatest prayer is a Greek word called monologismus, which means one word. What's interesting is that the fathers very much tell us to restrict our prayer to sometimes one word and sometimes no words. And I have some quotes to back this up. And this was interesting to me at first. Since my days in Sunday school, you guys may all know this. Who, who here knows the Sunday school prayer? You know the Sunday school prayer? They don't have the sick, help the poor, help the sick, help those who didn't come this week, come next week. Amen. <laughs> we all had this prayer. So when they tell us pray in Sunday school, personally, I wouldn't be able to because I'd be worried. What am I going to say? What are people going to think of my prayer? The problem is we become poets sometimes. We stand there before God, the thou master of the world, and oh, that's nice. I should write that down for, for later, right? We become poets. And we don't become broken people in front of God asking for revival. The idea of bro being broken is that we break ourselves so that Christ may rebuild us. But if we stand there like poets and artists and be like, yeah, you better accept this prayer because I worked really hard on this one. Here, check this, check this next rhyme out. It's awesome. That's not, that's not how we pray. So we try to restrict our words lest we fall into this trap of becoming um, poets in front of God. I'm reminded of Luke 18, 13. You guys know what happens in this thing? What happens is we have publican, or the tax collector, and the Pharisee. And they both have their prayers. And one of them is a pretty awesome prayer. The Pharisee, his prayer, he stands up there and says, I do this, I do this, I do this. It's not only that his prayer was about himself. He actually started quoting the commandments of God. I pay tithe, I don't do this. He quoted the commandments of God. So he knew the words. He, he knew what to say. He thought he had it worked out. And he had the whole position. He was on his knees, looking up. The whole position was right there. And we had the tax collector looking to the floor. He doesn't even consider himself in prayer with God. He's unworthy. He, he's, he, I can't pray to God. Who am I to look up? He looks down. He says, Jesus, like, he says, forgive me, God have mercy on me, a sinner. That's it. And that's it. What does Christ do? He says, that man walked away vindicated. That man. Because he realized who he was in relation to God. He understood God's presence. 
The other one only understood the presence of words. Words do not vindicate. And I'm going to refer to St. Micaius the Great here. Can someone read this? Anyone? Please? That's it. That's it. This is St. Micaius the Great. Yeah, who spent years and years in the desert. He can write like a Shakespearean play about Jesus. He can do it. What does he tell you to do? Lord help. Period at the end. Full stop. That's all. That's what you need. We don't need to become poets. Bishop Yusuf, actually, I, I'd like to refer to Pope Shunullah for this one, actually. Pope Shunullah sums it up. Um, hard coins, right here. Okay. Can someone read that? There's a prayer without words. The beating of the heart is a prayer. The tears are a prayer. The acknowledgement of the presence of God is a prayer. That's the key right there. The acknowledgement of the presence of God is a prayer. There's a prayer without words. So what His Holiness does there for us, is He expands our horizons. He says, no, do not contain or try to contain words. Into not- it's prayer into nothing but words. Um, now, I don't want you guys to get lazy. Because oftentimes people see this as laziness. So it's like, oh yeah, no, I don't need to hold the Yeah, fine, I'm not going to hold the Igbe. I'll just walk around imagining Jesus and period at the end. That's it, I'm done, right? No, because we have here St. Isaac the Syrian talking about people who have reached this level of constant remembrance of God's presence. Can someone read this? However, they do not neglect to stand on their feet so as to render honor to their prayer. In addition to their unwillingness to stand, they do on their feet. I'm sorry if I ruined your guys' flow. I know you guys were going home throwing out the Igbe. I'm like, I'm done with this. this but no. <laughs> MB Yusuf also echoes this. So if we could refer to him, please. Someone else read this. It is very good to have your own personal prayers aside from the Igbe. However, it should not replace, replace the Igbe, but, constantly, but Com- com- complement it. Therefore, you do not practice one without the other. So we need both. But the idea is, he's not saying just pray from only the Igbe. I actually, this is from experience. By the way, nothing I say here is from experience except for this one thing, and this is a bad thing. From experience, I used only the Igbe for a while, and I kind of like forgot how to pray. So don't do that either. You have to, you have to do both. Okay? I want to talk about characteristics of an accepted prayer. Um, prayer involves 100% breaking of the self. And the reason is that we are... We may not be in, in shatters, in pieces, but we are somehow not put together perfectly. And if anyone here believes they're put together perfect, you don't need to be here. You just, you just don't. Right? We are, in some way, imperfect. And the only person who can change that is God. So if we do not come to Him either broken or willing to accept being broken, then he, he, so He's a gentleman. If you tell Him step out, He'll step out. If you say, I don't want to be broken, I mean, what? he's not going to break you against your will. That's how awesome our God is. He doesn't break you against your will. So you have to allow yourself to be broken so that you can be rebuilt by God. I think our fathers are some of the biggest geniuses out there. Every prayer we begin in the Iqbay, we start with Psalm 50. Psalm 50 right there is a manual to prayer. Just one of the best manuals I've seen. It's, it's a product of David, the prophet, and his sin with Bathsheba, and his being rebuked by Nathan. So you guys all know the story, right? David sins with Bathsheba, that Bathsheba becomes pregnant, and to cover up for this, David ha- has her husband killed in battle. He feels bad. Well, he doesn't feel bad at first. Nathan the prophet comes in, and reproaches him. David is broken. David is broken. And he writes his famous Psalm 50. Psalm 50 is a perfect manual to prayer. He says, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. That line there, or else I would give it, so it's not up there, or else I would give it, I translate that to, say, to David saying, I wish it were that easy. If it was just about sacrifice, I, you know, I'm a king, just go, hey, give me that lamb over there, bring it to the altar, pull it to the altar, slaughter it, game over. He says, I wish it was that easy. Similarly, I wish it was that easy. I wish prayer was that easy. Hold up the igbeya, hold it, drop to the floor, up, drop to the floor, up, end of game. That's it. I wish. But that's not how it is. What is God interested in? David the prophet answers that perfectly. He says, A broken and a contrite heart, these, O God, you will not despise. These. No, he's not interested in your uh, burnt offerings. He's not interested in your how many times your head can touch the floor. He's not interested in that. He's interested in a broken and a contrite heart. 
Again, don't get lazy. Does that mean all I can do is have a broken heart and sadness and humility? And that's it? No, because what does David the Prophet say at the end of that? He says, then they shall offer bulls on your altar. So you have to have both. You have to be broken and then offer our prayer. You can't have one without the other. This breaking of ourselves is what we call asceticism. If I may here in, in, interrupt my flow and just talk quickly about laws of asceticism. Asceticism is not, we must be careful of an idea called Gnosticism. We mustn't be cruel to our bodies. This is straight out. We should not hurt our bodies to the point that we are unable to accomplish our daily tasks. People will tell you they, they, they sleep, you sleep three hours a night, so you restrict your sleep. The guy has to go and work the next morning, a doctor, and he can't focus. You should not hurt your body. We should be very careful. Asceticism should not be practiced, should not, zero, should not be practiced outside our Father of Confession's commands. I know a, a monk who I got very close with. He told me his first while in the monastery, he was accustomed to doing maybe 200 matanis before he entered the monastery. And he walked in and his father confession told him, I want you to do 10 matanis a day. Just 10 matanis a day. Who does this guy think I am? I'll do 100 a day. <laughs> but you see what happened there? Isn't a matanya supposed to break your will? But did he break his will? He did his will against his father of confession's will. You must be careful not to disobey your father of confession in asceticism. So all I'm going to give here is some ideas of asceticism. But firstly, I want to say where the joining of asceticism and prayer is. My basis, it's kind of scary, but prayer without asceticism is worthless. I know it's harsh, but hear me out. Our fathers relate to us uh, prayer as being incense. They use the shoryan. Prayer as being incense. So have you ever seen a priest hold the shoryan? not put coal and just take scoops of incense and put it in there it just does not happen I, I've never seen it work I don't know maybe a miracle happens sometimes but I've never seen it happen you take incense and you put it on coal then the incense you can smell it it rises same thing yes the incense is valuable and it's excellent on its own and it's prayer but you can't do anything with it unless you have that burning fire underneath it which is asceticism this asceticism can come in many different ways one of them is fasting. Fasting has kind of been, uh, these days people are like, oh, why don't we have to do fasting? Can't we do something else? No, fast. <laughs> Here's what uh, St. Isaac the Syrian says. I think he says it best right here. Can someone read this? When a man begins to fast straight away, he, yearn, he yearns in his mind to enter into conversation with God. He also says the table of a man who continually preserves in prayer is sweeter than the scent of musk and the fragrance of perfumes. And the lover of God yearns for this as a priceless treasure. See, so Isaac Syrian does something perfectly. He says, when he begins to fast, he yearns in his mind to enter into converse with God. Converse with God is what we call prayer. Remember, prayer, conversation with God. When he begins to fast, he enters into that ability. Don't ask me how. All I know is, Isaac the Syrian lived it. So, he, he's correct. That's all, that's all I know. Another one is sleep control. Now, when I say sleep control, I'm not telling you guys all to go home today and hold vigil until 5 o'clock and wake up for 7, 7 in the morning with death tomorrow. But what I am saying is for those of us <coughs> me, who sleep maybe 10 hours a day, try to <laughs> bring it down. Um, the idea is to humble our bodies. You guys know the ancient Cherokee saying? They have the, the conversation between the grandfather and the son. Grandfather, uh, uh, the uh, grandfather says to the son, there is a battle within us. Okay? between the, a dog, or a wolf, and a hawk. And they are battling for our soul. They are battling for, for, for some food. <laughs> uh, they, they, sorry, they are battling each other. They, they're fighting. And then the son looks up to the grandfather and says, Well, grandfather, who wins? Answer is simple. He says, The one you feed. The one you feed. If we want our spirits to overcome our bodies so, so we can stop those sins that are continually pester us, then we have to weaken our body and strengthen our spirit. We do both concurrently. If you restrict sleep, such that you weaken your body just a little, and with that time, use it for prayer to expand your spirit, I mean, it's just, it's just it's a major difference. So sleeping is one of them. I'd like to uh, refer to St. Isaac the Syrian here, because he refers to sleep and 
uh, gluttony, like eating too much, so not fasting, and oversleeping, he puts them in the same category as causing sin. Can someone read this for me? Anyone? Flat out. I don't know if I should comment on that. I think it's pretty clear. Um, speaking, so I don't think there's a cop out there who has not watched or has not even heard of Abuna Yostus Antoni, Rab Samit, Sa'kam, Dalwati, all that stuff. It's excellent stuff. And we have to, I mean, I think sometimes we've dismissed it. We're like, uh, it's just for monks. No, I'm not telling you guys not to speak. I'm not telling you guys to just say, I've been a Mawud and pick a catchphrase and be known as that person. But restrict your speech. And this is always something, especially for me. I talk from morning to evening. If you don't need to speak, try to restrict it. This is asceticism. Another simple way of asceticism is a simple smile. This is, you have to find asceticism in, in daily life. A smile can be ascetic. How so? Suppose you're having a bad day, it can be hard to smile. But you see your friend who's having a worse day, and he needs someone to smile on his face. If you smile against your will, so that you can you feel, make your friend feel more comfortable, this is you offering yourself on the altar of love for your friend. This is asceticism. By doing all these things, this is how we attain a life of prayer. Either our life becomes a prayer, or our acts in life become the fire underneath the prayer, allowing us to pray. So this is how we live a life of prayer. Prayer and asceticism. This is why in the fraction of Lent, we say fasting and prayer. Which really translates to asceticism and prayer, asceticism and prayer, asceticism and prayer. Okay? And yes, they cast out demons. So how to pray? Um, my friend, I actually once asked him, I said, you know, I, I can't pray. It's kind of hard for me to pray. So he proposed a 15 step, uh, 50, 15 minute, 15 minute preparation. Obviously there's prayer outside this, but I'm talking about those times, the prescribed times where you stand on your feet. I want to talk about a 15 minute preparation that I was given, and it worked just a little. I used to come out of watching TV, you know, I go pray and then continue watching TV, right? It doesn't work, it really doesn't. 15 minutes, I'm going to break it up into three, five, 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 okay? The first five minutes, all of this is on your own, of course. The first five minutes, sit with yourself and collect your thoughts. When we start praying, the devil immediately is like, oh yeah, but I mean, I got to study. I mean, you, you could have not studied. It's, it's like nine o'clock at night. You came in from school at two and you spent seven hours watching TV. The moment you start praying, I got to study, man. I got to test tomorrow, right? <laughs> Sit for those five minutes and acknowledge the fact that if I pray for 20 minutes, the world shall not end. And if it does, I'll be, the world will end while I'm praying, which is pretty awesome, right? <laughs> so for those five minutes, tell yourself, Organize your thoughts. I can do it after I pray. I can do it after I pray. The second five minutes, sit in silence. Try not to think about anything. Try just to empty your mind of everything you've been thinking of in the past while. Those worries and everything. One of the things I found helped me was one of the things one of my priests told me to do. He says, pick a random sound in the room. You guys see the projector? And focus on it and let your mind drift away for five minutes. After that, sing a psalm, sing a hymn, repeat the Jesus prayer, anything. After this, you'll be definitely, I don't know how much calmer, but as opposed to coming out of watching TV to pray versus doing the 15 minute and praying, is a huge difference, I hope. Um, pray throughout the day. So my friend uh, visited a Catholic monastery. And found something interesting. It's at 12 o'clock, a bell rings, and they pray a prayer to St. Mary. So they have a time throughout the day, they'll be working, they know they'll be in, in the fields, and then ding, stop what they're doing, say a prayer, and get back to it. Why can't we do that? In between classes at school, you know, bell rings, whatever, class is over, you're walking out on those steps out of lecture hall, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, sinner. Walking into lecture hall, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, sinner. My father confession told me a really cool thing to do. He says, take a mundane task throughout your day and ascribe prayer to it. So for those engineers who ever have to pick up pens, to sign things. Every time you pick up a pen, attach the Jesus prayer to it. Pick up the pen, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, sinner. You know? If you're a doctor, pick up the stethoscope, stethoscope, put it in your ear, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, sinner. 
and it becomes second nature to you. This is how to bless your day through prayer. Guys, use your father's of confession. That's key. Use your father of confession. Have him be accountable for you. Yeah, we're not accountable for prayer. We make excuses very well. I'm not going to pray today, but it's fine because I'll pray tomorrow. I'll pray double tomorrow. I'll pray three times the next day. Fine, fine. Right? No. If you have a father confession who you have an established prayer rule with, you're accountable. And he will ask you, if you are not able to be accountable to yourself and to God, your father confession will hold you accountable. And he will ask you, do you pray? And you will, yeah, I need, I pray. And he will force you that. <laughs> but you have to establish a prayer rule with your father confession. This may involve like bay prayers, a number of prostrations, your reading of the Bible, and a spiritual book. Don't do anything less than what your father confession says. Don't do anything more. Right hand blow and left hand blow. Pay very close attention to what he says and be honest with him. Talking about struggling with prayer now. I talked about prayer being the breaking of the self. Can you explain the right hand blow and the left hand blow? Sure. So left hand blow is the obvious stuff, in a sense. So in, in, uh, in, in sin. There's different kinds of sin. Left hand blow and right hand blow. So the left hand blow would be something like, um, let's get drunk. It's pretty obvious. Don't get drunk. Right? It's left hand blow. But the devil sometimes uses a right hand blow. It's being overly pious. Okay? So, um, <coughs> Abuna said that since it's fasting season, I'm gonna, I should abstain until 12 o'clock. Who does he think I am? Man, I'm the best faster in the world. I told him, I'm, come, I'm gonna fast until 6. I'm gonna fast until sundown every day. Take that, Abuna. This is the right hand blow over piety. We have to be very careful. This is how the devil gets a lot of us. If you can't get us this way, Pope Shunru calls the devil the rolling devil. If he doesn't get you one way, he'll just roll over to the other side. Either left hand or right hand. So be careful for both. We're going to talk about struggling with prayer. Um, as you begin to pray, even though at first it may have been nice because it's a new experience and the grace of God helps you through it, it may become a little difficult after a while. Like I said, prayer is a breathing of the self. And it gets really tiring. How do you overcome this? From the beginning, you must be armed with a strong intention to complete the struggle. Prayer is not a fine and dandy situation. It doesn't make you feel awesome. Okay? I remember one time I was speaking to, uh, to someone, and I was speaking to them about, they, they had an addiction to a drug. It was marijuana. Not addicted, they, they were fascinated with marijuana, sorry. I told them, why do you need marijuana? Look, it helps me feel better about myself. Uh, and they're like, hey, listen, I have marijuana, you have prayer. I said, oh, prayer? <laughs> marijuana helps you feel better. Prayer doesn't make me feel better. I don't walk out of there feeling like I'm ready to start the rest of my day. But it's necessary. And I, you have to push through it. So you have to have a strong intention right from the beginning. What does this strong intention mean? Have you ever realized how easy it is to pray publicly? For those of us deacons, say a response from the altar. <coughs> me, 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 me. Right? Great response, awesome. Like, you know, give a talk in church, best talk in the world. You know, Father's here, Father's there. Yeah, yeah, awesome stuff. I pray on your own, it's kind of hard. Why? Where are your intentions? Have and fix intentions. Is your intent to have people praise you for your awesome prayer that sounded so poetic? Or is your intent to persevere through prayer to attain the fruits of prayer? In a sense, prayer is no easy task. And if you're doing it right, it's hard. If, if it's too easy, speak to your father confession. You might be doing something a little too wrong. Um, St. John Climacus warns us against um, what the devil may do here. Can someone read that for me? Note how tedium hits you when you are standing. And if you sit down, it suggests that it would be a good thing to lean back. It suggests that you prop yourself up against the walls of your cell. It produces noise and footsteps, and there you go peeping out the window. It's like that. It's like what happens with our homework. You know, we put it off for five hours, but when I start to pray, it's got to happen now, not later. Now, right? Everything has to happen now, and it's only when you pray. You should say, "Have a father who, whenever he used to stand up for morning prayers, he'd feel like vomiting." He'd feel very sick, and on the way to church, he'd be tumbling over. And the moment service ended, he'd walk back to his cell, pretty calm. So don't let, uh, you know, a good buddy you know, get to you. Be careful. Be aware. But I don't want to scare you, because I guess it does get better. 
And St. Isaac the Syrian talks about this. Can someone read this? So just begin. Explain, explain. Okay. I'm, <laughs> so just begin. What it means is that in as man as much spends effort, spend the effort. Try to pray. 15 minutes. And yeah, it's going to be hard. Push through it. In as much as you spend effort, in as much as God will see that you are spending effort <laughs> and give divine succor, which is sweetness, to prayer. And yes, it gets better. It may take a long time. It may take... 70, 80 years, who knows? We may not even reach it, but it may begin to feel good. Until then, struggle. One of the biggest mistakes we do is we expect the, uh, the fruits of prayer a little too early. Who here is done gardening at all? Gardening? Okay, excellent. So you plant a seed? Like the real gardening, or do you plant like already grown stuff? Like do you plant, do you plant grown stuff? No, that's, that's no cool, man. The seeds. Plant the seeds. You put the seed in there, and then you water it. So, is that how I'm going to do it? I'm going to plant the seed and just stand there? They go, come on, grow. <laughs> grow! That's it. No. Right? I wait. I have faith that while I may not see the fruits, something's happening underneath. It may take time. There's a plant that I know actually that, I can't remember its name. It takes 100 years to sprout. <laughs> yeah, to break out of its seed, it takes 100 years. So, well, I'm going to go uproot it. I give up on gardening. And it may look... I mean, you're just watering some. You're watering dirt, and there's nothing there. But you have faith that even though you're just watering something that doesn't appear there right now, it will grow. It's exactly the same thing with prayer. So we're going to talk about the effects of prayer, and I'm almost done here. I'm sorry I took a little too long. We'll talk about what the effects of prayer are. The biggest effect of prayer is the biggest blessing of God. Like I said, prayer is communication with God, into communion and union with God. We are all united as brothers and sisters in God. We are all united to God through prayer. I'm going to not go into the whole theology of this thing. I want to take more of the spirituality of it. What St. John of Deliatha says, is he says this, anybody know St. John of Deliatha? St. John Seba? He says, he says, their union with God is like the union of fire with iron. Now I'm not going to talk about the specific um, inferences of this, but I want to talk about the example he uses. Has anyone seen fire being heated, uh, iron being heated with fire? It's a pretty simple process. You have fire and you have iron and you put them together. Right? I can't put fire in one end, iron in one end, and be like, catch fire. Because that's how it works. If I want to work on my union with God, I have to pray. I have to be in His presence. There's no other way to it. What happens out of this union of love that we have with God? Love. Love. I had a, a monk t- tell me this once. He said, Raymond, if you don't want to pray, don't pray. Don't pray. Prayer is a tool. It's not a virtue on its own. It's not, I have the virtue of prayer. Prayer is a tool. Love is one of the biggest things that happen out of prayer. And it stems out of being united with God and His love. If I love God so much, and He loves you know, this guy so much, how can I hate Him? A lot of times when the fathers talked about judging, they often ask themselves this question. If God is his master and sees everything and has not stricken him dead, who am I to speak a word? If God loves him, I love him. Right? Love is a product of prayer. If you have love, you are praying properly. (laughs) This love, I want to focus on it for a little bit. This love encompasses and destroys pride and judging if you judge what you've done is you've put yourself above a person looked down and made a decision about them and your decision is based often on a law does he do this does he do that and you become again the checklist if you look through the eyes of love which you engender through prayer what you see is I feel bad for this person because I've experienced this blessing of prayer and I really wish you could experience it too Let me help him. Let me empty myself. Let me break myself. And build myself up with him. Right? 
I'd like to refer to St. Isaac the Syrian again because he's uh, he hits the nail on the head. Can someone read that? This one's a little longer. And we come fearful of judging others. And look upon every other person better than himself. And if he sees other people, be they adulterers or unrighteous, he consider them as better than himself. A fact that the truly that he truly feels in his hidden conscience and not something just plain in his outward speech. This he does from a heart free of all impurity. He looks upon everything as good, for he looks and thinks with bad mind. He's talking about a change of person, not a change of act. He's talking here, he says, a fact that he truly feels in his hidden conscience and not something just claimed in his outward speech. So when people tell you, you you're a you good deacon today, no, 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 I just very good, that's very good. No, it's just a matter of, I know my place, <laughs> right? I know my place. I know who I am. People tell you, I mean, you do this well, right? I know my place. You're better than this person. I know my sins. I, I know them, right? One of the exercises I was told once to do is, yeah, you think you feel pride? How about this? Go into your room, get a tape recorder or your phone, and say your sins out loud to yourself. And record it and play it back to yourself. I don't think any of us can put up with it. It's pretty difficult. Just remember that um, judging is a sign of no love which is a sign of no union with God, which is a sign of not being able to pray. It's a cascade. Another blessing which comes with prayer is chastity. If we are so in love with God, then we, all, we love His creatures, what? With God's mind. So we love all His creatures with the same mind that God has towards them. God does not have a mind of lust. So if I pray and I am united to Christ, I do not have a mind of lust. It's not simply that I am, it is not right to look at a girl in such a way. It's just simply, I have God, I'm, I'm using God's mind. It just doesn't work. They don't work together. Another one is divine zeal. If you have the mind of, everyone wants their will to be done, correct? I mean, I have zeal for my will. If you have, if you have put on God's mind, then you have zeal for God's will, for His church, for His commandments, correct? And the last thing is that you become a blessing to, this ent- to the entire world. <coughs> You guys know St. Francis of Sisi? Ever heard of him? He has a really cool saying. Now I know he's not one of our Orthodox saints, but this saying is awesome. He says to us, he says, preach the gospel always, use words when necessary. Which means you don't need the wor- you, need, you don't need words to preach the gospel. What you do need to be is a changed person. And you cannot be changed except you pray. If you pray, you become a blessing to the entire world as it is. That's basically it. So what I want to basically say at the end is that it would be much better if you would take a look at these fathers with their experience. I mean, all I've done really is just put some of their experiences together and try to draw lines. But that's really only second hand. It's not that awesome. But we have an awesome wealth in our church. We have a beautiful depth, a beautiful wealth. These men spent their entire lives perfecting prayer. Spent their entire lives in a loving relationship with God. Why don't we... Take a look at what they have to say. So what I am asking for or insinuating here is that you speak to your fathers of confession. Ask them, I heard of this awesome book on prayer by Isaac the Syrian. What do you recommend? Maybe your father of confession will tell you to read it with his guidance. Maybe he'll give you something. But take a look at these guys. I mean, they have an awesome wealth. And I think we are at loss if we don't go after them. So that's it for me, and I'm sorry it took so much time. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments uh, for Raymond? No? Yes? Questions, comments? Moros? Yes. You said at one point near the beginning, um, and it's a good idea to kind of, it was like, weaken the body and strengthen the soul. Yeah. And one of the things that you said is like, uh, uh, like try not to sleep like 10 hours a day, or yeah. stuff, which I do too. So. <laughs> um, and like, just take some time and, and pray instead of sleep. But 
wouldn't that kind of go against the fact where you said if you're not concentrating in your prayer, it's not a real prayer? I, I see your question, but I want to I wanna make a differentiation here. I'm not saying feel your prayer. Okay? What Pope Shunua tells us is that even if you don't feel your prayer, the devil feels it. So pray. So if you offer your, your attempt at prayer, that's more than enough. Now, I'm, what I'm saying is, if I'm, like, if I'm just going to pray and be like, uh, yeah, well, I'm thinking, um, let them build the walls of Jerusalem, which I'm on an altar, I'm really thinking, there's a cool TV show on at 8, i got to finish it at 7.45. Right? But if you're tired, and you try to force yourself through prayer, that's fine. Repeat, if you, if you say a psalm, for example, and you're feeling, oh, I, I didn't really get that, just repeat it again, and try it over and over. It's, quant- it's uh, quality, not quantity. So just push yourself, yeah. You don't have to feel your prayer. I mean, if you do, that's great. But if you don't, that doesn't mean don't. That doesn't mean to stop. And that's exactly what I was saying. Push through those times where you feel like, no, I don't feel it. That's what struggling with prayer is, because you're not going to feel it forever. Push through it. Cool. Okay. I'm not sure uh, this answers it, but I thought like the way I saw it is like you don't need ten hours to concentrate at the same time, right? Yeah. There's a difference between sleeping enough and sleeping yeah. sleeping excessively, right? I feel like. You can function after like six to eight hours of sleep. You don't need ten to twelve hours of sleep. You can still concentrate for six. Yeah, if you're getting ten hours of sleep and you still can't concentrate, I mean, you need to see a doctor. (laughs) 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 Pretty simply. (laughs) Sorry. Um, It's written in the wisdom of Salaam that um, if you want to sleep, if you want to sleep less, um, it's it's best not to fill your stomach before you go to bed. See, it always goes together. Actually, the fathers tell us that the the father. Uh, fornication is gluttony, and the mother is oversleep. Mix those two together and you can drive yourself. Recipe for disaster. <laughs> but, uh, just a comment on what you were saying. Um, constant living out of prayer. Um, Saint Seraphim of Sarov says, acquire a peaceful heart and thousands around you will be changed. So that's essentially exactly that's, it. The, that's what it is. Exactly it. People are changed by the presence of a Christ-like person. Has anyone read the book Father Arseny here? Ever heard of it? <laughs> Yeah, awesome book, right? It's the story of a, a Russian monk who was in the Stalin regime. It's just a story, and just a bunch of stories, maybe seventy stories. The interesting is, thing is, he was he was in a concentration camp, uh, heavy heavy work, you know, very dangerous stuff. There's about seventy stories. I recall around fifty of them involving atheists. These atheists ranged from criminal atheists who had murdered, from intellectual atheists who had lectured in universities, and at the end of every story, except one of them. They say, yeah, he, was, he became converted. Some of them became priests, some of them became monks, some of them became his disciples. How? Father Arsene never once stood up and said there, we believe in one God, God the Father, and he didn't stand up and defend, he didn't use apologetics, he didn't do all this stuff. What did he do? He was a Christ-like person in the middle of a dark world. He was that light. That changes people. And Father Arsene did that by constant prayer. That's all we need. No, I, was, I was just going to comment... Uh, Back to uh, uh, Morbus's question, um, just a, a, a comment, something that I read uh, by uh, Bishop Anthony Boone, I think it's beautiful, in Living Prayer, um, where it's not about feeling, I, I, I echo what you say about the feeling of prayer, it's not about what I feel at the moment, and what I really liked um, in, in your talk is the, 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 the articulation, or prayer is me being in the presence of God, so it's not, it's not so much about how I feel, God in, in a particular moment uh, will reveal himself to me in the way that he wants. So it's either, maybe it could be through a feeling. He wants me to feel his profound love at that moment and I'll feel the, the action of the Holy Spirit in my heart and I'll feel. But if I, don't feel, if I don't feel the same way the second day when I pray, it doesn't mean my prayer is unsuccessful. Exactly. So feelings aren't the, the basis. Again, feelings aren't the basis of prayers. Maybe God wants to to bring me at one moment, he wants me to humble myself and bring myself at my, like bow down in front of him, go come to my knees and, and offer myself in a particular, he wants to reveal himself in a different way and he wants me to experience him in a different way in order that I can experience full, full, pre, his full presence. I think, I think, and I, I really like that you stressed that throughout the talk that really it's, it's, it's about being in the presence of God. <coughs> Important. Imagine if we did have that feeling constantly, though. Wouldn't we get pretty prideful? Right? I mean, we would. 
I had a friend who would tell me I'm struggling with prayer. You're struggling with prayer, man. I'm the best prayer guy in the world. Man. Let me help you out, man. Get pretty prideful. But thank God he's very, very careful with us. <coughs> yeah, um, you know how you said you could do little things like, um, like Smiling. when you brought up the example with the engineer and like picking up your board on the What do you plan? Like, what, what do we achieve from that? Again, like Joey commented on the practice of the presence of God. That's that's that is prayer. The practice of the presence of God. So if you pick up your pen and you say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, sinner. You bring to your mind the remembrance that you are always in the presence of God. I mean, God is with you at work, right? So yeah, but if you do it like that often, don't you think it kind of like dilutes, kind of? Like it dies down. If I'm constantly saying it and saying it, I, I mean, I, I can't like tell I you from experience. Even mean it once I, say I, it. I can't tell you from experience, but from what I've heard. So I hear things about you guys ever hear of the monks of Mount Athos, who literally go to sleep and wake up and realize that they're still praying the Jesus prayer that they that they were praying last night. Some of them will pray to their sleep. <coughs> they've, they've come to a point where it doesn't really die down. I don't know. I, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Maybe someone who's experienced it will, but I, I don't know. Forget. Yeah, I think. I, to answer this question or an example of it, you just say all the things in the church. Yeah. Like they just say like, Lord Jesus Christ have mercy on me. Like, have you ever seen them getting into a car? Yeah, I'll be a shot. I'm a shot. I'll be And the three saints, I'll be a shot. All the children, the cuspidors. They say the whole, they say the whole commemoration of the saints walking into a, walking into the car, right? But they mean it, right? They tell about the, the reflex. Hmm? The reflex, the natural reflex. Yeah. 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 Right? And sometimes we try to we try, try to fix those words and we try to like use words that sound like them but aren't really them. <laughs> Why don't we try fixing it with a prayer? Scare it on the bismis salib, right? Scare it. Scare a you if you know what I'm saying, right? Why don't you try being like those tons, fixing that? Right? And that way, instead of saying something bad, you actually build yourself. Cool? Mike. Um, saying the Jesus prayer, so I think comment and You guys ever hear that joke about they say cops? They, they say cops are oversaved. They pray before they pray. We say, Lord, make us worthy to pray, our Father. As if the, they pray before we pray. Isn't this exactly what the centurion said to Christ? He said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, I don't feel, help me. Lord, I don't know how to pray. I don't feel like it's working. Help me. I mean, God, God will help you. He's, he's not. He's not. He's not a taskmaster behind you. He wants you to pray. If he gave you prayer as a gift, he'll give you the help to get through it. Cool. One more point with regard to that, George. With respect to, like losing losing um, respect to the prayer, to the arrow prayer, because you're constantly doing it. I think, um, like you said earlier, it's not supposed to be easy. So always try to force yourself to be aware of why you're saying the arrow prayer. It's just awareness. That's what you're you'd lose out on if you um, become complacent and just. You know, say it as if it's another thing, like a passerby you're walking by but, uh, on the street and not recognizing their face after. Be aware of what you're doing. I, I want to also con uh, continue uh, with Mina's uh, point. Um, also, I, I heard this in, in, a, in a sermon by Abuna Armea Bulis. It's in Arabic. I'm sure some of you might have heard him. He was saying, um, I mean, it's about being creative too. In, in these in these mundane <laughs> it's about out no it's about it's about it's about being being creative in, in that in, in in your prayer in these mundane things so he gives an example it's like when you're walking out the door you say Lord as I'm opening this door uh, allow me to enter your kingdom or you're entering your house Lord allow me to enter your kingdom you're putting soap on your hands a person with heights washing being washing and washing being white in the snow you're taking a shower Lord cleanse me uh, as I'm washing myself, cleanse me from my sins. Like you turn. I have a friend who did that actually. He put he put posters all over his wall, little little things on his door. Uh, he put like uh, here I stand at the door and knock. On his heater, he put uh, bless the Lord of snow uh, or, or cold and heat. <laughs> right? So anyway, here you are day. This, you're right. It's it's all about keeping your mind in the memory of God. And this is what I said: the memory of God penetrates your entire life. 
and your entire life becomes a prayer. You don't need to necessarily be standing on your knees or standing on your knees for your entire life. But yeah, your entire life becomes a prayer. Sorry.